When Jupiter devastated the fledgling solar system. For a long time, the structure of today's solar system, characterized by practically circular, coplanar, and equispace planetary orbits, was believed to be the result of a quiet evolutionary history that would have led each planet to form in the same position where we see it today, and where it would remain stably in a condition of dynamic equilibrium with its neighbors. In recent years, however, the opposite point of view has gained acceptance, which sees planetary migrations, especially those of the giant planets, as a decisive phenomenon in the evolution of the solar system as it can provide an explanation for various still unclear issues, such as certain planetary masses that are too small, asteroids of different mineral composition mixed in the main belt, the strangeness of the Trojan asteroids, the remote Kuiper belt populated by a variety of object types, and finally the mystery of mysteries, the intense meteorotic bombardment some 3.9 billion years ago that began suddenly and for no apparent reason a full 600 million years after the solar system began to form. Well, all these puzzles can be explained by a kind of planetary billiards game that began when Jupiter and Saturn began to go around and disrupt the orbits of neighboring planets. In light of this interpretation, which is beginning to be widely accepted by the astronomical community, everything we thought we knew about the formation and evolution of the solar system must be reconsidered. All the more so in an age when technology is opening the door to statistical analysis of extrasolar planetary systems. Undoubtedly, the greatest change in perspective in considering the origin and evolution of the solar system is that of abandoning the idea that planets formed where we see them today. The underlying hypothesis, still believed to be essentially correct even in our time, has always been that planets were the final stage in a process of aggregation in which gradually larger and larger objects emerged from the initial chaos of dust and gas. A planet-building mechanism, in short, that took place at the expense of the material that the dominant objects, let us call the more massive planetesimals destined to become planets by this name, managed to suck out of the disk of dust and gas that surrounded the Sun at the very beginning of the formation of the planetary system. Each planet was thus the result of an efficient and thorough cleaning of the region of the protoplanetary disk corresponding to its orbit. It is no coincidence that the IAU General Assembly held in Prague in 2006, the one that will remain famous for downgrading Pluto, also based the definition of planet on the concept of efficiency in cleaning the orbit of dust and other minor bodies. In this reassuring version of an all-too-quiet and stable planetary system, however, there was something that did not quite add up. Analyzing the accretion patterns of Uranus and Neptune, for example, revealed that to be able to become so massive in regions where the disk of dust and gas had to be more rarefied and the orbital velocities of the planets lower and therefore less efficient at collecting would have taken much longer than the two planets actually had. To glean their hydrogen content estimated at about one Earth mass, it would have been necessary for the two planetary embryos to have a mass equal to at least a dozen Earth masses. And not only that, this mass had to be achieved before the gaseous component of the solar system's accretion disk dissipated, that is, within a maximum time of about 10 million years. In short, if they had really formed where we observe them today, Uranus and Neptune should have been much smaller and with much less hydrogen than they are now. Then in the last decade, there had been the added novelty of more and more objects being discovered beyond Neptune's orbit, with differentiation into complex dynamical families – centaurs, plutinos, classics, scattered, cubanos, etc. And the presence of those dynamical families emerging more and more sharply and precisely from the dark regions beyond Neptune was silent testimony that at some time in the formation of the planetary system, extremely effective dynamical mechanisms must have been activated capable of sorting those objects into the routes they travel today. The time had come in short to try to seriously rethink the planetary construction scenario that had hitherto held sway. The key to the mystery, planetary migrations. In 2005, the result of the collaboration of four astronomers at the time working at the Nice Observatory, a revolutionary new theory burst onto the scene, kicking off what would later be christened the Nice model. 
The mathematical model helps hypothesize that the four giant planets in our solar system did not originally occupy their present positions, but arrived at them at the end of a kind of dynamic migration. Not only that, the effects triggered by these sudden migrations also managed to account for many of the obscure points on which previous models failed or were unable to pronounce. According to the Nice model, 600 million years after the formation of the solar system, the four gas giants initially traveled in nearly circular orbits lying in the same plane, with an inclination of less than a tenth of a degree, with Jupiter 5.54 astronomical units away from the Sun, just 0.34 AU further than it is now. Saturn near resonance 2 to 1 with Jupiter and thus distant around 8 to 9 AU, Uranus at about 11 to 13 AU as opposed to 19.2 today, and Neptune at about 13.5 to 17 AU as opposed to 30.1 today. Far beyond that, there must have also been a disk of planetesimals extending to a distance of about 30 AU. Of course, it is always good to remember that one astronomical unit, which is distance separating the Sun from Earth, is equal to about 149.6 million kilometers. And now, let us try to briefly reconstruct the stages of the eventful early stages of the formation of our planetary system, according to this new scenario. Jupiter begins its formation, a fairly rapid process, more or less where it orbits today, that is, at just over 5 AU, and as a result of interactions with the disk of protoplanetary material, narrows its orbit gradually approaching the Sun. Further outward from Jupiter, Saturn had also formed, while in the innermost region other planets had almost completely formed. These were not, however, the planets we observe today, including Earth, but larger planets destined to become those super-Earths we observe in extrasolar systems. In its migration, then, Jupiter narrows its orbit, pushing itself to about 1.5 AU from the Sun, after which, through the action of resonance with Saturn, it reverses its dangerous march and widens its orbit to its present position. This wandering of the giant planet, however, triggers a catastrophic process. Jupiter drags planetesimals between 10 and 100 kilometers in size with it in that migration, captures them by the mechanism of resonances, and exaggeratedly pumps their orbits. The result? A mad swarm of objects in chaotic orbits that collide with each other and generate in the innermost region a disk of gas and debris. Because of the interaction with these objects, fragments, and the disk, the super-Earths, or what was left of them, inexorably end up crashing into the Sun. Once Jupiter, having accomplished that havoc, reaches the position in which it still resides today, a new planetary formation begins in the innermost region that, unlike the first, can now rely on the availability of much less material. It is this second generation that results in the construction of the present-day terrestrial planets, where Mercury, and especially Mars, will be deprived of the opportunity to develop a mass more in keeping with their status as a planet. Uranus and Neptune, meanwhile, migrate rapidly and chaotically outward, interacting even more intensely with the planetesimals in the disk, a situation that explains very well the formation of the Trojans and the different dynamical classes within the Kuiper Belt objects. During this escape, by the way, it is possible that the two planets swap places with each other a possibility that emerged in 50% of the simulations and is really valuable to be able to justify the excess mass of Neptune to Uranus. After these chaotic phases, the system calms down, and simulations show that the orbital characteristics, semi-axis, eccentricity, and inclination of the four planets correspond very well to the current ones. Also weighing in favor of the validity of the model, however, is another important result. The orbital chaos in which the planetary system suddenly found itself immersed may in fact explain the mechanism that initiated the most violent period the solar system went through, that of the intense bombardment unleashed 700 million years after planetary formation, and for this reason called late heavy bombardment. It was during this period, which lasted roughly between 4.1 and 3.8 billion years ago, that the impacts gave rise to the huge scars that we can still observe today on everybody in the solar system. Just take a look at the seas of the moon, an event that is difficult to explain if we admit that at the time the planets had already formed and therefore had already cleared interplanetary space. 
Where then did that sudden wave of projectiles come from and what caused it? One could invoke the destabilizing action of Jupiter on the asteroidal belt, but there would be some major problems justifying the intensity of the bombardment with the material available in that region. The problem seemed destined to remain unsolved, but the scenario suggested by the Nice model with the disruptive action of Uranus and Neptune on the planetesimals of the outer solar system suddenly diverted to the inner planets seemed to have succeeded in accounting for this mystery as well. It goes without saying that the massive diversion to the innermost regions of the system, therefore also to our planet, of a large number of icy planetesimals may in its own right constitute a plausible answer, though not the only one and perhaps not even the best one, to those who wonder where Earth's water might come from. The reliability of the dynamic story told by the Nice model meant that it was soon transformed from a possible alternative model to an indispensable starting point for subsequent analyses and simulations. It was a choice that allowed planetologists to succeed in explaining with sufficient reliability other situations hitherto considered inexplicable, such that of the strange composition of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, where mainly two types of asteroids coexist, some with low, others with high water content. According to the gas-induced migration scenario, Jupiter may have intercepted two populations of small celestial bodies during its migration. Those now located in the inner part of the asteroid belt could have originated from the area located between 1 and 3 AU from the Sun, while those in its outer part would come from another region beyond 5 AU. And that's not all. What we have told you about so far relates only to the Nice model, which is, however, some 20 years old. Further statistical modeling conducted with more reliable data and computers has allowed us to speculate that, in fact, Jupiter may have formed 4.6 billion years ago, even on the periphery of the solar system at a distance of at least 20 AU from the Sun. And this would explain another planetary puzzle, that of the Trojan asteroids, consisting of two groups of thousands of asteroids that proceed and follow Jupiter on its own orbit locked in the Lagrangian points L4 and L5. The puzzle lies in the fact that there are about 50% more Trojans in front of Jupiter than behind it. It is this asymmetry that has become key to researchers' understanding of Jupiter's migration. Indeed, the astronomical community had not yet been able to explain why the two groups do not contain the same number of asteroids. And it was thanks to extensive computer simulations that researchers calculated that the current asymmetry could have occurred only if Jupiter formed four times farther into the solar system and subsequently migrated to its current position. During its journey to the Sun, Jupiter's own gravity would then have drawn more Trojans in front of it than behind it. According to calculations, Jupiter's migration continued for about 700,000 years, for about 2 to 3 million years after the celestial body began its life as an icy asteroid far from the Sun. The journey to the interior of the solar system followed a spiral path in which Jupiter continued to revolve around the Sun, albeit in an increasingly narrow path. Simulations show that the Trojan asteroids appeared when Jupiter was a young planet without a gaseous atmosphere, meaning that these asteroids are more likely made of building blocks similar to those that form Jupiter's core. Having come to the end of this roundup, what can we say more generally about the new evolutionary path of our planetary system. Certainly, it is a much more chaotic and less relaxing path than we were used to considering, and it will probably take us some time to get used to the idea that the planetary dance that seems so repetitive and almost monotonous to us today may be the child of moments of genuine chaos. As much as we may care about our habits, however, the unquestionable merit of this new model is that it proves to be up to the task even where its predecessors and fail. This does not mean at all that everything is now revealed and that we can finally archive the dossier solar system. As Carl Sagan said in the mid-1970s in the introduction to a collection of articles devoted to the solar system and space exploration, the story of the solar system is still to be told. Its origin is shrouded in mystery and its evolution is only imagined. Thirty-five years have passed, but Sagan's statement seems barely pronounced. Something has broken through that mystery and imagination has been transformed into concrete models. 
but there still is a long way to go.